right, we're beginning again now in, in this book of Joshua coming to the close. As I said, I didn't know that I was going to preach this message, but uh, it's a very familiar phrase in chapter 14 that's been preached down through the ages. And uh, we're going to deal with chapter 13 of Joshua just a bit by way of introduction to this message. And then we will get right into chapter 14 as the Lord helps us this morning. And then, of course, even this evening as God would help us to do as well. But this general theme of crossing Jordan into real victory. And uh, now that we've come to this portion of where we are in chapter 13 and chapter 14, uh, things are beginning to change. The uh, main conquering of Canaan is somewhat completed. Joshua's, uh, I guess his ministry, his job is uh, beginning to change considerably. When you think about him in the beginning of all this, you see Joshua and his military adventures. We saw Jericho, Ai, and then, of course, uh, Gibeon, all these others that we've covered thus far, these many battles and still some, uh, to, some land to be possessed and taken, as we'll see in the Scripture this morning. But he's changing somewhat to, from a military, uh, in his military adventures, to uh, somewhat of a management administration as God has got him to dividing the land among those various tribes, as they are conquering and possessing and winning victories, God said, now I want you to distribute this land. Uh, why would God want them to take the land without giving it to them? Wouldn't make sense, would it? And so Joshua is beginning to do that. Uh, somewhat, somebody said his uniform is beginning to change. Uh, he's changing from a soldier's uniform to a supervisor's uniform. His position has moved from that of a commander to a civilian and from a general to a governor as he's beginning to distribute this land uh, that flows with milk and honey. And he's trying to encourage the people of God. He said, this is what God promised us, especially when it began with Moses. You remember God gave uh, Moses the uh, instructions, go get my people out of bondage down in Egypt. And he did. And they, of course, wandered in the wilderness for some 40 years. And God had promised them the land of Canaan, that land that flows with milk and honey. Now they're there. And Joshua was encouraging them, said, Make yourselves available for the land that floweth with milk and honey. In other words, don't get here and don't, don't enjoy it. Uh, you know, some, some Christians think that if they get saved and born again, uh, you know, after you get saved or born again, that you, you live a boring life. Oh, no. The Christian's life is full of joy and peace. And, and I'm, 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 listen, I'm living, and we ought to, as the old hymn writer wrote, and the choirs used to sing it, living and camping in Canaan. We ought to live in Canaan and camp in Canaan. Well, what is Canaan? It's the victorious Christian life. And as I've been preaching over and over again to you, and I may mention this again, God does not intend for us to be defeated Christians. He wants us to be victorious Christians, can I have an amen? amen. And so when you think about that, uh, I, I, you know, this, this land of milk and honey, uh, that's joyous uh, land, uh, a happy land. And I think that we ought to look like we're happy Christians. Amen? amen. So now smile. Will you do that? Uh, let's, let's show the world that Jesus gives joy uh, to our lives. And so as we look at this message and we'll think about Joshua as he's beginning to change in his roles uh, in, in the midst of all of that, we still need to make sure that we have the mindset that there's still much land to be possessed. And so in the midst of all this, the beginning of chapter 13, God gives, uh, if you will, a declaration uh, to this aged leader. He's, he's older now. Joshua's older in age. And he gives him not only a, a, a declaration uh, an announcement to this aged leader, but he also assesses the land, and we'll see several things about that. So first of all, in verse number 1 of chapter 13, here's the announcement to this aged leader. The Bible said, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, uh, It's one thing for Joshua to know it, but here's the Lord. He said, uh, Joshua, you know you're old, but I'm going to tell you you're old. It's amazing when folks just start looking at you, you know, and, and uh, these, these youngsters come along and said, you know you're really old? <laughs> One of our young, young people now, they're a teenager, and boy, they're growing up and everything. And when I first came here as pastor, they were just a baby. 
maybe being carried in, that little bassinet, whatever you call them, little things. And uh, they, they were brought in here. And uh, they look up and we talk about other pastors and that was mentioned. We talk about the past pastors of El Bethel Baptist Church. El Bethel was, El Bethel was established in 1803. I believe it was. 1803. Uh, and, and so you think about it, this is a long time ago. And this young, young person said here a while back, said, there was more preachers before him? <laughs> yes. But see, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm all they've ever known, see. They grew up, and, uh, been, and they were small. And so uh, sometimes young folk will look at you and say, you know you're getting old. Well, God looks at Joshua and say, uh, you know something? You are old. And so the Bible says that. Now Joshua was old, stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be Possessed. And so this announcement to this aged leader, as the Lord is giving him, and he and the main emphasis is upon his age. Why? Because he said, I want you to make sure that you stay busy in the completion of the duties in Canaan and the dividing of the land. Don't give up, don't give up your duty yet, Joshua. You still got some work to do. Let me say something to you. Uh, if you're a senior citizen or you consider yourself a senior citizen this morning. Uh, and older, hey, listen, God's not through with you yet. Can I say that to you? I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything. My feelings were hurt the first time I walked up here at Hardy's, and I was just, I just turned 50. And, and the dear girl behind me, she gave me the senior di discount. That offended me. It doesn't anymore. <laughs> I asked her, right, I said, senior discount, please. I want that senior plate. Give me that senior plate. Uh, but but uh, listen here. God does not want you to quit. If you're still alive, say amen. amen. All right, we got most of you are. If God's left you here and you're still alive, God's got something for you to do. It may not be the, to the capacity of what you once did, but God is still wanting you to work. I'm reminded of that old hymn as he's looking here and what he's got here in the word of God. He said, Joshua, you're old. The Lord tells him that. You're stricken in years. I'm reminded of that hymn said, work for the night's coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid-springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming when man's work is done. There'll be a day we'll be all out of here. And uh, when that time comes, friend, it'll be over with, uh, for you and I. But until then, just stay busy. As the other hymn writer said, work. Uh, he said, we'll work till Jesus comes. Amen. We'll work. And we sing that hymn sometimes around here. So when you think about that, uh, you know, don't give up the fight yet. Don't give, up your, don't give up your responsibilities. You just stay busy doing what God has called you to do. Can I have an amen? amen. I will remind you this by way of side note and application to your life. And this is something you need to make sure you understand. Young person, you need to understand this as much as us who are older need to understand this. And that is that time stops for no man. Now we have read where God stopped time to give the battle uh, for, for Joshua and, and the people of Israel gave them time for the battle. But never before or never after, God said it's never happened again. Time does not stop for any of us, doesn't mean there's who you are. Time's not going to stop. And what you're to do, you're to, you're to do now. Stay busy doing the work of God. You say, preacher, I'll get right with God later on. Uh, you may not have that opportunity. You're not promised a tomorrow. Time's not going to stop, so you must do what you're going to do. Do it right now. Uh, you know, there may be projects, things that you want to get done uh, for the Lord. You better stay with it and do it now. Now, I know that some wives are probably looking and said, you heard what the preacher said, projects. we got some projects around the house. Now, I'm not necessarily meaning that. I'm talking spiritually speaking here. But now, it can't apply there. There's some things you need to get done. Now, that job you were supposed to do eight months ago, it hadn't been done yet. You need to probably get it done. Make your wife happy if somebody say amen, ladies. All right. Time doesn't stop for anyone. He said, Joshua, you're old, well stricken in age. And what he's trying to remind him and encourage him to do is keep going on. There's not only a, 
an announcement to this aged leader in verse 1. Verses 2 through 6, we won't read the verses there in chapter 13, but there's the assessment of the land. He talks about uh, summing up that. At the end of verse number 1, there is a statement I want to read at the very end there in this assessment of the land. He said, there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. There's some still some things that need to be done. And so we need to do them. It's not time to lay down our sword and our shield. It's not time to quit on God. It's time for us to get busy doing what God has us to do. And so there's the assessment of the land. And then he moves in, in verse 6. Uh, if you look, here's the assurance of the Lord's help. In the middle part of verse number 6, I'm not going to read the entire verse, but in the middle part of that verse, it said, Them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. What is he saying here? Here's the assurance of the Lord's help. He's given an announcement to this aged leader. He's told about the, in verses 2 through the first part of verse 6, he talks about the assessment of the land and what he's going to do to continue to divide all of that and how it's to be divided. But in the latter part of verse number 6, uh, he tells him, he said, I'm, or in the middle part, he said, I'm going to help you. I want you to get serious about doing the work of God. Let me, let me give you this thought. This is applicable to our life right now. I believe it will fit right here in the Scriptures. God will get serious when you get serious. I want to repeat that. God will get serious when you get serious. We have certain things that we pray about. We have certain things that we're concerned about that burdens our hearts. And many times we say, oh, Lord, we, I know you're God, and I know you can handle it, and he can. He's the God of all ages, the God of all creation. There's nothing too hard for God. Do you believe that? Amen. But a lot of times we say, God, we want you to handle all this while I sit back and do nothing. Well, that's not going to work in battle. That's not going to work in this, in this passage of Scripture here. God said when you get serious, there's still much land that needs to be taken and possessed. There's still some work that needs to be done. And God, listen, God's not going to come down here and pay the bills. He wants us to pay the bills. He's not going to come down here and run these worship services, although, God, we need him in our services. And he's here today. And we know the Holy Spirit's moving and working. But God said, I want you to get busy. We're concerned about people in our family we pray about all the time. But we say, God, we, we want you to take care of this situation. Then we walk away from it. You say, well, preacher, I'm trusting God, and he knows. I prayed about it. But he wants you to continue to pray about it until the answer comes. Pray and talk to the Lord. There's some things about it. You get serious with God, God will get serious with you. You turn around and just walk away from it and say, Lord, yeah, I know you're sovereign. You can handle everything. You just take care of it. And I know we ought to trust him, and that's putting confidence in him. I understand that. But we ought to continue to pray, get a hold of the throne of God. God, please touch. Please touch. I remember a story one time. A lady came down in a revival service to a certain evangelist and a preacher, and she handed him a note with her child, one of her children's name on it. He said, I want you to pray for my child, preacher. He said, sure, sure. I, I told you that I'd pray for him. If you, if you gave me a name, I'd pray for you. He said, the preacher stood there and he took the name of that child. And he said, but I want to ask you something, dear lady. He said, how much do you pray for me? She said, well, well, well I, I've prayed for him. He said, do you pray every day, two or three times a day? He said, you're expecting me to pray for them when you're not even willing to pray for them. Now, the Holy Spirit must have prompted that dear evangelist to say that to that dear lady, not trying to hurt her, but trying to get her to understand, if you get serious, God will get serious. And Joshua was giving the announcement, this aged man, get busy, there's still land. And he talks about the assessment, and then, of course, he gives the assurance, I'll be there with you. Hey, listen, God's not going to let you down, but he's not going to give you a crutch to lean on either. He wants you to get up and, and get in battle. Do your part. Don't depend on God for every little thing in our lives. I did not. Now, when I got out of bed this morning, my wife had gotten up a lot earlier than me. And so she comes in. Hey, turn it there. Well, Brian, I thought the trumpet was about to sound. I looked over. I'd already. I woke up a little earlier, and I looked at the clock, and I said, well, I got about 30 more minutes before I get up normal time. So I was still laying there, but I dozed back off. She said, get up. I said, it's a beautiful, sunshiny morning. Let's get with it. I said, boy, this is going to be a good day. 
This is bound to be a great day. Amen. Yeah. But listen to me. You know, I know that the Lord kept me alive through the night. I know that he gets me up every morning. But I got to put forth a little effort to put my leg over the side and slide out of that bed and then go to the shower, turn it on, get in there, shower up, get dressed. God's not going to do every little thing for me. There's some responsibility that we must take for ourselves. Do you agree with that? He said, there's the assessment of the land. I'm always going to be there. I, I, I'm there with you. Uh, God will never let you down. He said, I got your back in this thing, friend. Make sure that there's still some things that must be done. Then in verses 32 and 33 of chapter 13, let's look at that. Verse 32 and 33. I'll read these two verses. The announcement to this aged leader, the assessment of the land, the assurance of the Lord's help. Here's the agreement of the land. And how it's fulfilled. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for the inheritance in the plains of Moab. In other words, it's already been given. The orders are already given. Now, on the other side of Jordan, see, Moses didn't make it over there. And that was by Jericho eastward. But he said this here, and Moses, when he gave Joshua instruction and the people of God instruction concerning the distribution of the land, he said, it'll be dis distributed to whom God has chosen. But verse 33, but unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. Do you see that? As he said unto them. Now the agreement of the land was given to whom God had promised. But now you got the Levites in verse 33. I was thinking about this this morning. Can you see all of them when Joshua's begin to divvy out the land? This portion goes to you. This portion goes to you. And he goes right down the line and talks to every tribe. But here you got Levi, the tribe of Levi. And he looks at them and says, you don't get anything. <laughs> now, how would you feel about that? We got, we got folks with multiple children in the house. And if you had three or four children and you start giving out goodies and candy, and you come along and you say, here, this is for you, and here, this is for you, and here. And you come down that last one and said, no, you don't get anything. Well, why am I not getting anything? The answer is in verse 33. He said, you don't need the land. You got the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, that's preachable right there. You don't get any of the land, but you got the Lord. I'm your inheritance. Let me say this to you. If God never gave you one more thing in your life, if he never granted any goodness to you as far as material things of this world, would he be enough for your inheritance? Would he be enough? to satisfy you, if you didn't have anything else in life, but you just had Jesus, would he be enough? Huh. I thought about that while I was looking over that this morning. I said, man, how real is that? We got so many people, oh no, oh no, Lord, I want some of the land. They'd leave the Lord behind. How bad would that be? He said, boys, he said, one thing for you, that tribe of Levi, he said, I'll be your inheritance. There's still some land that has to be subdued, the driving out of the enemy, but God is going to be their provider in every area of their life. Thank God I say again to you, God's got your back. <laughs> you may feel like you cheated. You may feel like you didn't get everything, but God's got, if God is on your side, he's in your inheritance, all right? We're talking about crossing Jordan into real victory. We're going to come to chapter 14 now. And here's the message. Taken from verse number 12 of chapter 14, there is a statement in verse number 12, and I don't know that we'll get to all of that today, but I want this morning, but I want you to look at verse 12 of chapter 14. Caleb is stepping on the scene now. He was the other original spy. You remember him? There was Joshua and Caleb. Those two were the only original spies that's here on the scene right now. Everybody else that was their age and older died in the wilderness. Only the children that were born in that 40 years, they are with them now. Joshua and Caleb, they're the two originals. Nobody else made it. You say, why? Because they came back with a good report. 
They came back with a report to Moses, said, Oh, the land's there. It's flowing with milk and honey. Boy, there's oh, there's grapes over there like we've never seen before. Boy, we got all that we need and ever will need. Oh, it's wonderful, Moses. Let's go on. God said, We could have it. The rest of those spies, those other ten, said, I don't know about it. Said, There's giants in the land. Oh, thank God. Hey, listen to me. I don't, I'm not worried about a giant if I got God. Amen. Here's Caleb. He's going to step on the scene now, and he's going to talk about some inheritance for him. In verse number 12, the Bible said, and this is a very famous passage of Scripture that's been preached for many years. Now, therefore, here it is. Give me this what, church? Here's Caleb stepping on the scene in this thought, and that is the subject of the message this morning. Give me that mountain. Give me this mountain. Give me the mountain that I'm claiming, Lord. And he's talking to Joshua and he steps up and we'll see that in the scripture. And, and of course, as I've been preaching to you and I said over and over again, God intends for us to have victory in our life. And I ask you this morning, do you really have victory in your soul? That's a question for you to answer. Do you really have joy? Do you really have happiness and joy and contentment and peace in your heart and that joy that will help you day by day? Do you have that today? When you think about that and when you see this here in the Scriptures and how that He's promised them that and the problem concerning these promises is that most Christians today and some of you are sitting right here and I'm going to guarantee you this and I'm going to say this. I'm not saying this hurts your feelings but there's some of you that's going to bypass the promises of God in this message this morning. You're going to bypass the promises of God that you can have real victory in your life and you're going to walk out those, those doors this morning still living in the wilderness of defeat. You say, why? Because you're going to choose to. You say, preacher, that's bad. You've told us how good we are. Well, all right, I've given you a lot of that. Now tell you, I'm just going to tell you what it's all about. I mean, really, say, are you hearing me? There are so many who sit in the, and if I don't get the, here, here's, there's so many who sit in the house of God and they don't hear not one or two words that's coming out of the preacher's mouth. Why? Because they got their mind on everything else. We might mention that a little bit later on in this message. But that's exactly the way it is. There's going to be a lot of, you can talk to them till you're blue in the face. I was talking to a counselor from another state uh, who lives about, probably about close to nine, ten hours away from here. And I said, how's things going, man? It's going great. And I said, boy, we're going on. He said, I don't know. He said, I ran a couple out of my office the other day. I said, you did? He said, I looked at him and said, you're not listening. to Anything's coming out of my mouth. So the man got so mad, he stood up and said, the woman's jaw dropped and fell on the floor. And I said, well, what, what did they do? He said, they stormed out of the room. And I told them to. He said, go, oh, I love you, but get out. He said, when you're ready to listen to what I'm saying to you, come on back in and I'll help you. He said, I got a text the next day from the husband saying, I'm sorry. I got a little mad, didn't I? He said, I'm just so sorry for walking out on you. He said, you're right. He said, I'm not listening to anything you're saying. They're coming for help. Joshua said, hey, God's got it for us. Caleb said, God's got it for us. The other ten said, we don't want it. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And now Caleb's coming up on the scene again. Don't bypass the promises of victory and choose the wilderness of defeat and discouragement. Please don't do that. As a result of their choices, all of those who wandered in the wilderness, uh, they didn't have the peace and joy and the fellowship and the power and the glory of God that's going to be Caleb's and the others. We think about this. You know, I, let me give you something else before I get in. He said, Preacher, you're, you're really on it today. You're right. She got up early, but she didn't make me breakfast. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We always buy it, all right. But listen to me, are you hearing me? You know what kind of Christianity we got today? We got what you call window shopping, religion. Window shopping. Yeah. How many of you ever window shop? Come on, raise your hand. Come on, yeah, some of you lie. You ain't like, you ain't read it. You go window shopping, you look, boy, boy, that looks nice, boy, that's great, you know. And some of you, sometimes, but you'll, you'll sit there and gaze at it. But you'll never get it. I'm bad about that. I've been in many times in shop, and my wife, she knows and she can testify to the fact. I've been in many times, and I look and try on. I, 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 that's good. Looks great on you. And then I put it back, and never walk out, and never buy it. We got a lot of Christians like that. They window shop us. 
They're gazing at it, but they never get it. You say, how does this apply? You're gazing at victory. You're seeing it right now on the pages. You're gazing. You're window shopping, but you'll never get it because you're not willing to step over into real victory. So don't be that Christian. Don't be that Christian. Be the Christian that will give yourself unto the Lord. So we think here and we come to, as I said, chapter 14. Chapter 14. Caleb here, this original spy, steps on the scene. He's a man that's willing to pay the price, fight the battles. He's willing to conquer the city. He's willing to claim the victory that God has waiting for him. He's going to reach out and reach forth and take hold of that. That's exactly what we ought to do. Let me give you a couple of things about the promised land. The promised land was release. If you're taking notes, write it down. The promised land was release for the children of God. You say, what do you mean by that? They had been in slavery down in Egypt. And when they stepped over to the promised land, when they stepped, stepped over into Canaan, God gave them victory. God released them. They're no longer in bondage. They said, boy, we feel a release. I want to tell you what, when I, when I knelt at the altar, when I got on my knees before the Lord many, many years ago and I gave him my all and I said, Lord, I want you to take me, use me. God, whatever you can do with my life, you take it and use it. You want, you, you want me to tell you what happened that Sunday morning? I felt a release. A release in my soul. You say, what happened? I stepped over into Canaan land. I stepped over into real victory. I said, God, whatever you want, you take it. You take my life completely. It's yours. I felt released. The promised land was released for the children of God. The promised land was not only released for the children of God, it was rest. <laughs> you say, what do you mean? They could rest in the Lord and rest in that land. It was not only release and rest, but you think about this here. It was refreshment. Refreshment. <laughs> Why? Look what they had been eating in the wilderness all those many years. And now they're in a land that floweth with milk and honey. I usually don't do this during Sunday mornings. We either make something at the house or either we'll go and buy us a little sandwich, breakfast sandwich, and come down here and eat it. But I was in there this morning, and I'd gotten ready pretty quick, and I just got in there, and I saw that jar of honey on the counter. And I was wanting to so bad just to turn it up. He said, Preacher, that's nasty. Well, I'm the only one that eats it. But I just want to turn it up like a glass of tea and just drink me a big old gulp of it. Give me a little sugar high this morning. Amen. Some of you said, you must have drank the whole jar. <laughs> but I wanted to, but no, I, I got a little something else and, 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 and uh, satisfied myself with that. But I, I was thinking about that. Hey, listen, they're in a land that floweth with milk and honey. They're not eating leeks and onions and all those other things, but God has given them milk and honey and fruit and all the glorious things there. What, what, not, not only what a release and a rest, but it was a refreshment for them. When I gave my whole life to Jesus Christ, what a refreshing day that was. When I realized that I didn't have to worry about the life of sin as far as running that same road anymore, but I had Jesus along with me. I was not only occupying the land, but I had the Lord with me. Amen. When the sirens would go off, I wouldn't run and hide. Amen. <laughs> wouldn't run from the law. Why? Because you'd done no wrong, see. Things had changed in my life. And so there was... Release. Some of you need to be released this morning. There was rest. There was refreshment. And you know what Canaan, our promise, the promised land was for them? It represented a reality. A reality. You see, they had heard about it. They had heard about it, but they had never experienced it until now. Let me say something to you. I've seen God move in what we call, the Bible uses the term, revival. I've seen the Holy Ghost of God move in what I call a real Bible revival. No special evangelist preaching. No special singing group singing. No big time crusader there giving some big message. All it was was one individual right in the congregation getting up and confessing before God. 
that God had changed their lives. And it so touched my heart that I walked down that aisle that Sunday and God changed my life. You see, I'd heard, I've heard about great times, but thank God it became a reality when I stepped out by faith. I say this to you, the children of Israel, they'd heard about it. They'd been wandering in the wilderness for over 40 years. They'd been with Moses. Moses told them, said, man, there's a land over there flowing with milk. The spies even came out. Oh, yeah, it's there. Joshua and Caleb said, we can take it. The other ten, they said, ah, we doubt. We doubt that we can do it. I've preached to you already down through these many weeks and months from Joshua already talking about the land. We're here. It's a reality. We're right here. And I'm going to tell you, hey, listen, you say, where is the reality of victory for me? Right here on these altars. That's a reality for you. You can live the victorious life. You can have joy. You can have peace of mind if you'll just be willing to take it. It became a reality. They were there. They were seeing it. What they had heard about, it was a reality in their life. And so here they are, resting in that wonderful land. God is working in their life. He's given refreshment to them. It's a release for them. And Caleb comes up now, and he comes before Joshua. Joshua, in the book of Joshua, represents the Lord Jesus Christ who brings them into that land of promise. Moses brought them out of bondage. Joshua took them in. Joshua is the New Testament Jesus, if you will. Jesus can satisfy your soul. You say, well, what's Caleb represent? We've seen what the promised land represented, what Joshua represents. What does Caleb represent? Caleb represents that determined Christian who's not willing to settle for less. He represents that one who say, you know, well, preacher, I've heard you preach about it. I've heard you talk about it, sing about it, but I want it. I want victory, and I'm willing to give my whole life to see God work in my heart and in my life. Let me give you the closing portion of this. We'll continue tonight. We're going to look at number one, look at verse six. This is where we begin. Chapter 14, verse six. Here's the character of Caleb. There's about four other points to his, this message tonight or this morning. There's the character, there's the commitment of Caleb, there's the confidence of Caleb, there's the, there's the courage and, of course, the campaign and, of course, uh, the crowning of Caleb as God gives him exactly what he's asked for. But I'll, I'll just deal with the character this morning. Look at it now, verse 6 and 7. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. And here's Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kenizzite. He said unto him, talking to Joshua, he said, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me, Caleb, and thee in Kadesh Barnea. He said, Forty years, verse 7, old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me. And of course, you too. He's talking about the spies going over. How the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Now, Caleb's just reminding Joshua of what had happened in their life. If you remember, Joshua, that Moses sent us out to spy out the land. You and I both came back with that good report. And he's speaking about himself. He said, you and I came back with this good report. The other ten, they had a bad report. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But he said, we've come back with a good report. And just like we told Moses, it was in our heart to give him the report that we saw and so he's, he's talking about his character. When you see jo Caleb and Joshua, but especially Caleb here in his character, here's a man that was tried in his character. His character was one that was tried. It was one that was truthful. It was one that was trusted. Notice here in verse number 6, he said, Thou knowest, thou knowest the thing concerning me. And I'm kind of abbre abbreviating uh, toward the end of verse number 6. Thou knowest the thing. That the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God concerning me. Here's a man that was tried in his character. Here's a man that was trusted. He said, for the Lord has sent me, along with you and the other. He sent us to spy out the land. And he was very truthful before he said in the latter part of verse number 7. He said, I brought him word again. Talking about Moses. He said, we brought back the word to Moses as it was in mine heart. Caleb was a man of Christian character. The Bible said in verse 8, go to verse number 8, the last 
I think it's uh, verse 8, the last part of verse number 8. Let me just give you a phrase there. The Bible said that he was faithful in his service. For why? He wholly followed the Lord. Do you see it? Look at verse number 9. Last part of verse 9. He wholly followed the Lord. Look at verse 14. You see verse 14? Here's again. He wholly followed the Lord. The Lord God of Israel. Here's a man that was faithful in his service. He was tried, trusted, and truthful in his character. But if you go back to Numbers, if you take your note, you don't have to do it, but just put this down in your notes. In Numbers 13 and verse 30, he was fervent in his spirit. The Bible said, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Back in there in that first trip over, he said, Let us go up at once and possess it. Talking about the land of Canaan. For we are well able to overcome it. And the Bible tells in Numbers 14, 24 that he was favored in his service. The Bible said, he said, my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, or he's wholly followed the Lord. He was a man of character. He was tried in his character. He was trusted in his character. He was truthful in his character. Here's a man that gave his all to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm willing to fight any battle. I'm willing to conquer any city. I'm willing to do exactly what needs to be done to have real victory in my heart. Let me ask you this here. What are you willing to do as far as your character and your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? We'll kind of tie that in now. The commitment to the Lord. What are you going to do and willing to do in your life to have real victory in your life, in your family, in everything about you? Having real victory. Think about it now. Let me give you a couple of things in closing here. And I'll probably go over this again tonight. But thinking about commitment and giving your all, not being a half-hearted Christian. There were three little girls that were talking one day about their dads. And while they were talking about their dads and this thing of character and commitment, one of those little girls said, you know, my father is a doctor and he practices medicine. Well, that's what a doctor ought to do. The other little girl spoke up and she said, well, I'll tell you what, my father's a lawyer and he practices law. Makes sense, doesn't it? The third little girl said, my daddy is a Christian, but he doesn't practice anymore. Think about that. One little girl said, my daughter's, my, my daddy, well, said he's a doctor. He practices medicine. The other one, my daddy's a lawyer. He practices law. third one said, my daddy's a Christian, but he doesn't practice anymore. Let me give you this in closing. A couple of years ago, close your Bible. We're done. We'll pick it up tonight. A couple of years ago, we had a little event. We've done this quite a few years now, but we've had little events, and we, on this particular event, we had our young ones come in, not our teens so much, but they were helping with games or whatever that day, but we had some of our smaller ones come, come in that day, and they came in, and we had, we had somebody to come in and speak to them, a special speaker. And it was a husband and wife team that day that came in and spoke to our kids, and I, Cindy and I were just was going around doing all the other things, getting things ready for the snack and all that they would have afterwards. and We were doing things and busy, but I stepped into the back when the speaker was speaking to, I think it was the young boys, young boys. The girls were somewhere else. But he handed out some papers and said, I want you to put a prayer request on this paper. So I'll be sure to pray about it. He showed me. What names on there so much and uh, on the on the papers? But he said, just write a prayer request out. Now I just told you about three little girls, but here's right here at El Bethel Baptist Church. Are you hearing me? Are you listening? One of the little boys wrote that day. Said, please pray for my daddy. And here's how he termed it: He's lost his Christianity. Now that's right here. Please pray for my daddy. He's lost his Christianity. Now once you're saved, I don't believe you can lose salvation. 
understand. But that kid was just trying to put it in the terms of what he was feeling about his own parents. Little girl said, my daddy's a Christian, but he doesn't practice anymore. My daddy's lost his Christianity. That's the way that child looked. You see, you're not going to have victory in your home. You're not going to have victory in your life until you make a full commitment. Be like Joshua and Caleb. Caleb had another spirit about him. He had a spirit where he went up to Joshua and said, do you remember what Moses told us? What he said about me? And he said, I want that mountain. I want that mountain. I want to possess that mountain. How about you? Do you, do you want to live in victory or do you want to live in defeat? My daddy's lost his Christianity.